Today we're going to be talking about grazing corn residue and um, my goal here is really to talk about some of the common questions that I get which uh, come down to how do I determine the stocking rate and how do I determine uh, when we need to uh, move essentially and then the other thing that I get a lot about is questions about supplementation. And so I'm gonna also kind of talk about supplementation needs for various classes of cattle. And then we'll, we'll answer any questions that you have. So uh, as we go along, if you have some questions, you know, you can interrupt me. I'm happy to answer them as we go, or we can do it at the end, whatever you're most comfortable with. Okay, so the first thing that I, I wanted to talk about was spring calving cows because honestly that's the most common group of animals that we see out on corn residue. And so I wanted to point out here really just the requirements and most of the spring calving cows when we start grazing corn residue would be really in that mid gestation or you know basically the middle of their pregnancy. And they have relatively low requirements then. We're only, you know, requiring about 11 and a half to 12 pounds of TDN and um, 1.6 pounds of crude protein. And so we can, we don't have to have a really um, highly nu nutritionally dense diet. And in fact, corn residue often is much better than what their requirements are for mid gestation if we're grazing it uh, because they can be quite selective. For late gestation, it bumps up. So if you think about that uh, December time period, December, January time period, uh, right before uh, spring calving, uh, the requirements do increase and you can see it's a pretty big jump for both uh, TDN and crude protein. And so we really wanna think about that as we think about our grazing methodology. And, and I'll show you here in just a second that as we think about grazing corn residue, the best stuff in the field is what they select early on. And so um, there are some things we can do with our management to try to make sure that we have a little bit better corn residue available later in the season, one of which is just moving to new field, for instance. Okay, so understanding what's available to the cattle is extremely important. And what I have here is just the quality of the plant parts that are available. And so most of you probably know that the grain that actually gets left in the field, of course, is going to be the best energy that is available. Uh, probably people don't really think of it as a protein source, but in fact, relative to other uh, corn residue that might be out in the field, it's actually one of the highest sources of crude protein as well. Uh, so we hope, or at least I assume the farmers hope that most of that ended up in the combine and didn't end up in the field. And so at this point, we really usually have very little grain in the field. So what do they really select? The next digestible thing in this list here, the husk, is what uh, cattle tend to select the most of if they can get it, hold of it because it is the most digestible, has the most energy, it's quite palatable. It's one downfall uh, is that it's a little bit low in crude protein. Luckily, when we look at what cattle eat, they eat husk and leaf when they start selecting. And so uh, the leaf's a little bit higher in protein, which helps us out. Then if we look at um, the amounts of residue, what we see is that husk is not a great proportion of what's in the field. So if you think about it as I have all of this residue out there, what's available, the mat, the majority of it is stem or stalk. And if we look at the stalk digestibility, you see the energy value in that stem or that stalk is very low. Um, you know, it's somewhere around 35 uh, to maybe 40% TDN. So it cannot meet even that mid gestation cows requirement. Um, and so we don't want to be eating this. And in fact, the cattle don't select for it. They select for that husk, they select for leaf. And as we get later in the grazing season, if we don't move them on and husk and leaf starts becoming less available, they start substituting cob in, in fact. And it's also not very digestible. So we don't want to start doing that. So we really want to be concentrating on husk and leaf. And in fact, husk is the key determinant in my mind about when it's time to move have had um, some producers. I had one guy who was talking to me 
about his grazing management. He says, gosh, I have to fence a lot of fields to use. And as we started talking, what I learned was the way he was determining when he needed to move was when there was no more grain in the manure. Um, that's probably uh, too early. And in fact, it is too early because uh, then you're only using the grain and you're missing out on most of the residue. And uh, I can't imagine how much fencing he ended up doing to try to uh, only feed whatever grain is left in that field. All right, so if we look at the quality of residue selected, um, this is some data that uh, Terry Kaufenstein uh, put together years ago. And uh, this is in vitro dry matter digestibility of what the cattle actually selected. You can just think of this as kind of the energy content. It's not quite TDN. It's actually a little bit higher than what the TDN would be. But I really just wanted to use it to show you that over the course of the grazing time in a field, uh, the quality of what they collect or the digestibility of what they can select starts decreasing. And it makes sense because they start having a harder time finding, for instance, the grain early on. And then if we think about leaf and husk, uh, husk in particular starts becoming harder to find. They start substituting more leaf and even substituting some cobs. So this is actually what they were selecting as they went um, throughout that time of grazing. Now this was, uh, if I remember correctly, in the 80s, and there was a little bit more grain in that field. I can't remember the bushels per acre at this moment. Um, but you can see they were still able to get some grain into 20 days into the grazing period uh, in this particular instance. But my point here is really that we want to be thinking about what they're consuming and what's available, and we can use that to determine when it's time to move or time to go. And in fact, I think if I remember correctly, um, right around here was, was that time period where I would have suggested we were ready to go that 40 days. But the days on the field really depends on how much residue is available. So the way we can determine that is pretty easy. And that is that the amount of residue in the field is tied to the corn yield. So we can use the corn yield information to tell us uh, approximately how long we should be able to get out in a field. So my rule of thumb um, is for every 100 bushels of corn taken out of the field, I can graze a cow for about a month. Uh, now that's a pretty crude measure, but it gets you in the ballpark. Uh, this table here is kind of a little cheat sheet. It basically has corn yield in the bushels per acre, and then it has basically um, how many animal unit months you could get if you want to do it that way, which that's basically a thousand pound cow. Um, or you could look at it as a 1200 pound cow for 30 days. How long could you go? Um, and then I have it in days if you want to go that way. But I like to just think about it um, because we have three things that vary. Sometimes this table is a little hard to use. So I can show you easily how to calculate it. And so in this instance, I just said, I have a 160 acre field. It was a good irrigated cornfield. It was 220 bushels an acre. And I want to put out 150 cows. How long can I graze? So it's pretty easy math. We have 220 bushels an acre. Remember, I want to get it into uh, every 100 bushels gets me one cow month. So I just take uh, the 220 bushels an acre, divide it by 100 bushels, and I get 2.2 cow months per acre. Then I take that times my acres and get how many total cow months I can get out of that field and just take that and divide it by the number of cows. And that gets me how many cow months I can get. If you want to know that in days, you just multiply it by 30. And so in this particular scenario, it's about 70 days. I said it's a rule of thumb and it gets you in the ballpark. It's a good for planning purposes. However, um, nothing's perfect and uh, the weather really can change things. So it's all about the husk in my mind. And this is what I would use to determine when it's time to go. It may be earlier than that 70 days uh, in that particular scenario. So you want to go out and be looking for this in the field. One of the things that I've noticed over time is that that rule of thumb works as long as I don't get 
either a bunch of wind loss. So if my stock direction is uh, with the wind and I happen to have really short um, stocks in the field, I might lose a lot to wind. Uh, I also see a lot of loss to trampoline if you happen to get a little bit of a warm spell and some pre precipitation. Um, and so it, you may have to move earlier than what we uh, would suggest. So check out the husk. So I have in this picture kind of, uh, a, this is actually a 220 bushel and acre field. And on the one side here, I have the grazed uh, component. And then I have basically there's a line down the middle and this is the ungrazed side. And this has been grazed to our recommended rate. And if you look at it, it doesn't look too bad, right? It doesn't look um, like we've taken off a lot of uh, residue. And in fact, it's removed about 15% of the residue, which is actually that target because we're looking at when the plain and nutrition for a spring calving cow is no longer going to be met without um, additional feed. And so that 15% of residue removal or that one cow month for every 100 bushels, that's really what that's based off of. It's based off of the requirements for that gestating cow. The difference here between these two is really about husk. So if you start really looking hard, um, yeah, I really can't find much husk in here. I, I looked through this the other day and I could find two um, chunks of husk in the side that was grazed and I could find about 10 in the, the part that wasn't grazed. And so uh, really it's if you start walking the field and you have to start hunting for husk, it is time to go. It's time to move. Um, I wouldn't think about uh, how much leaf is left out here or how much stem. We don't want to be using up all the leaf and we definitely do not want them to be eating the stem or even the cob. So as I mentioned, the weather can have huge impacts. And in fact, this field was grazed at the recommended um, stocking rate, if that makes sense. It was just a really high stocking density. It was put on in the spring. Uh, when um, it was wet, it, we waited till it rained and we actually stocked with um, some calves at, to graze off a 220 bushel field in approximately two weeks. So as you can imagine, you look at this out there and you do not see much cover. I am not suggesting you do this. This is, this is not a picture of what you should look like. But my point here is that it will have a huge impact. Uh, if you get that wet period, you lose a lot to trampoline, you may need to move earlier. So you got to stay on top of just watching what the field is telling you and moving when uh, the residue starts becoming limiting. And you probably don't want it to look like this. Uh, it doesn't really cause uh, long-term effects in terms of compaction, uh, but you know this is pretty rough to have to drive over with the planter. Okay, so do I need to supplement these spring calving cows if I graze to those recommendations? So if I make sure that they can select um, that husk and leaf, can I get away without supplementing? This study was actually done um, in eastern Nebraska over three years and Rick Rasby did this work where basically he took uh, spring calving cows they were in good body condition score when they went out in October. And then what he did is he started in late gestation supplementing two pounds of distillers um, to one group. And so that's what the supplement group is. Um, and then the other group, they didn't supplement. They did graze at our recommended rates. And you can see that in February when they pulled off, the cows had maintained body condition score that received no supplement. Uh, the cows that received the supplement did actually gain in body condition scores. But what other effect did it have? It had no impact on pregnancy rates, um, birth rate, or calf weaning weight. So they really didn't see any effects there. Some of you may be thinking about um, the work that Rick Funson has done looking at really fetal programming. And in fact, you know, they've shown that when you are grazing dormant range, for instance, 
if you supplement protein, you get some positive responses in the progeny. Okay, so you get some positive responses in the calf that is inside of that cow uh, while she's grazing that dormant range. So they actually did look at what happened to the heifer progeny or um, the heifers that were inside the dam that were either supplemented or were not supplemented while out on stocks. And they really saw no impact. So no differences in average daily gain post weaning, no differences in uh, when they uh, reach puberty or their pregnancy rate when uh, they were fully developed and bred. And so the bottom line here is that if we graze at the recommended rates and allow those cattle to be selective, we actually don't need to provide supplement. We don't need supplemental protein uh, to spring calving cows. Assuming, of course, that they are uh, mature cows, and we'll talk about immature cows here in a second, um, and that you don't need them to gain in body condition score. If you do need to gain body condition score, a little bit of supplement can help you out. Um, for instance. And then the other thing to consider is if we have a really bad year. I do you remember it was a couple years ago, we had a really cold, um, actually kind of wet uh, winter. And if you have uh, cold and wet, you can increase their energy requirements. So you do want to monitor their body condition. And if they start slipping, you want to provide them some supplement um, just to make sure that you get them into the right condition for calving um, so that they will get easy to be rebred. So, you know, you want to keep them in that five uh, going into calving at, at a minimum there. All right. So the other thing that I wanted to, to just mention here is that if we think about utilizing the recommended stocking rates, I know there are some people who are probably looking at it going, shoot, there's still a lot of feed out there. Um, but if we think about using the recommended stocking rates, we're, we're getting away without having to provide supplement. We are only removing, you know, that 15 to maybe 20% of the residue unless we have a really bad um, spell where it's really wet and it happens to be warm and we trample in a lot more forage. Um, so we can leave some good ground cover. And if we look at the costs, um, I just have kind of a range in dollars per acre, which is typically what I see for people renting out corn stocks. Um, I know in Western Nebraska, we can get up to $30 an acre and actually in, in some parts of uh, Eastern and actually even South Central Nebraska, I sometimes see $5 an acre. But I just wanted to really show you that the cost of corn residue is very competitive on a cow, uh, per day basis. Uh, if we look at this, you know, $20 uh, an acre for a low yielding field is 70 cents. Um, that's a little high, but if you look at hay uh, costs, for instance, um, hay will not compete even with that. So if we think about uh, utilizing that 15% and allowing us not to have to supplement, that looks pretty good. Of course, now we got to add in costs for water and for fencing and for going out looking at those cattle, but uh, I think it's a very good deal to use corn residue. Now you do need to supplement those dry cows, uh, some mineral and vitamins. And in particular, the things that I really uh, want to focus on would be vitamin A. I think that's extremely important because the corn residue is uh, very low in vitamin A. So uh, if you're using a four ounce uh, free choice mineral, you know, I want to target 140,000 international units per pound. So that's what you would look for on the tag. Um, you do need to provide some phosphorus, uh, especially if there's not much grain out there, they're not going to get very much phosphorus from the corn residue itself. So I usually target a four to five percent phosphorus. And then the two most common deficiencies that we see in terms of trace minerals um, nationwide, but also in the forages in Nebraska and uh, in corn residue is copper and zinc. And so I typically am looking for ranges in here for a free choice mineral that I might suggest uh, for those spring calving cows. And one of the things I, I want to point out about the copper and zinc in particular is that, especially in late gestation, those cows are providing all of that trace mineral that that calf is really going to get until it starts eating a lot of solid feed because the milk is a poor source. And so 
um, they actually really chuck a lot of those trace minerals into the calf, into their li uh, the calf's liver. And so if they don't have it, they can't do that. And copper and zinc is important for the immune system of that calf. And so I do think it's important in that late gestation period to make sure that we are providing uh, what those animals need. Okay, so what about bred heifers grazing corn residue? I said those are mature cows. Um, bred heifers are a little bit different, right? They have higher requirements. And in fact, uh, in mid gestation, even grazing at the recommended stocking rate, we're about a half a pound of crude protein short for those animals. And so uh, I really think distillers is a great source of that crude protein. It's usually uh, one of the cheapest sources of protein and uh, two to three pounds of uh, dry distillers can meet those needs. And if you're using modified, you know, you're gonna have to feed a little bit more, of course, because it has uh, water in it and uh, we want to be targeting the same amount of dry matter. So we got to feed a little bit more modified, but if you can get a hold of modified uh, for a good price, um, I really like it. It actually has a little bit less waste as well if you happen to be feeding on the ground. Uh, late gestation, we become short in both energy and protein for that bread heifer. And so we got to bump up the supplementation rates. And so three to five pounds of distillers, um, six and a half to nine of modified. So Bread heifers are a little bit different. And if you are going to be grazing bread heifers out on corn residue, you do need to be providing some supplements. So you might take your bread heifers and even put them in with um, heifers that you're developing, for instance, because these amounts of, of distillers can get you uh, decent rates of gain for those developing heifers and can allow you to then supplement both and, uh, and make a a decent sized group, so to speak. Uh, so I talked about the stillers and I talked about using modified or, um, or dry distillers. And I do want to point out because there are some people who still don't realize that distillers is a good source of energy and that it has 104 to 108 TDN. Don't go by the test that you might get back from the lab. It uses the fiber content uh, of the distillers to try to predict the energy value. And in fact, a lot of that energy actually comes from uh, the protein that we would be overfeeding. And so we actually get a much higher energy value if you look at the performance of the animals. So good source of protein, good source of energy often can be low cost. Pointed out that you could graze um, you know, developing heifers on corn residue, you can gray stalker cattle on corn residue. I just have here uh, basically a chart based off of performance of calves that we um, grazed on corn residue and supplemented various levels of, of distillers. And, and we can really target any level of uh, gains that we want. Uh, based off of how much distillers that we supplement while grazing corn residue. Uh, for many of you, you're probably looking at this and you're looking at uh, the percent body weight and you're going, okay, now how do I convert that to how much I need to feed? That's what this table is. I just took um, that equation, uh, calculated various average daily gains that you might want to target, and then how much distillers you need to supplement. So this is how much dry matter you need to supplement, and then I converted it for dry. Of course, you got to feed a little bit more because it's not 100% dry matter. And um, for modified, you got to feed even more because it's got a higher water content. But you can see that um, very easily, if I was wanting to, say, grow developing heifers, I could um, grow them at a pound, a pound and a half a day. I could feed uh, basically two uh, to four pounds of distillers, put them in with those bred heifers, and life is pretty good. Okay, now one of the other questions that's cropping up more and more frequently is about fall calving cows. And I wanted to point out that early lactation, which is a lot of times where we hit, maybe uh, mid lactation if they happen to be really summer calving cows. And the requirements of a lactating cow is so much higher than a gestating cow. I can't emphasize that enough. I see a lot of people who want to be able to put out a lick tub, for instance, 
um, to those lactating cows and think that'll meet their requirements. Um, just look at the difference in requirements here. She's requiring you know, 16, 17 pounds of TDN and almost three pounds of crude protein to meet her needs in early lactation. Uh, that is equivalent if she could eat two pounds or 2% of body weight of a 65 TDN um, diet and 11% crude protein. That's pretty hard to do with corn residue without some significant supplementation. Now this is early lactation. And in fact, that's kind of her peak lactation. But the thing is what happens at peak lactation, which is, you know, that 60 to 90 days post calving is also when we want to start breeding her. And so we don't want to skimp at that point. Uh, otherwise, we might regret it in terms of the number of cows that come up open. So if they were in early lactation, uh, you really probably need to feed about seven pounds of uh, dry matter from distillers to meet her needs. Now, if distillers is $150 a ton, that's still not too bad. That's 52 cents uh, per day from that distillers doesn't look too bad. What about moving into mid lactation? So let's say you had summer calving cows like July, August calving cows. They're kind of over the hump in terms of peak lactation, um, but they still have a higher requirement in terms of uh, compared to say a spring calving cow who's just uh, pregnant. Couple of things to think about when you're moving into mid lactation. Number one is that um, you have that calf who also has a requirement and a 90 day old calf will start eating uh, not an insignificant amount of dry matter and it can eat about 1% of body weight. And so uh, one of the things to, to think about as we move into mid lactation is that that calf has a, has a higher requirement from or can utilize more feed um, than during that early period. Then the other one is if you happen to be going from early lactation to mid lactation, like say you have a fall calving cow and you're later into the winter, um, is the energy available from the residue declining because um, the amount of husk out there is declining? Do you want to decrease the amount of distillers that you feed? This is a battle uh, that I don't really know the answer to. Um, my opinion is probably that we can do a lot with uh, a little bit of distiller supplementation in terms of the payback that we get. Now, whether I put it through the cow or put it through the calf is, is uh, one of the questions that I get. I will say that there's some data that suggests that the cow is just as efficient at utilizing that feedstuff as the calf and making the milk. Uh, available to that calf. So this is a study where they actually did summer calving cows. Um, this Carla Jenkins uh, worked with um, Jim McDonald and they did a study where they took uh, cows with four month old calves. So, you know, they're over that peak lactation and, and they started supplementing five pounds of distillers per pair. And what you see is that uh, the body condition score did decline from November to April. And so we did have this decrease. So we weren't quite meeting that cow's needs. However, think about the timing of that. Um, we typically, if you think about a four month old calf and you're going into April when we might traditionally wean, we often do that in our systems where we have a cow who's going to pull off a little bit of condition prior to weaning and then will gain a little bit of condition after weaning um, during that period when she has her low requirements, right? That mid gestation period when she has those low requirements, it's really easy to gain a little bit of condition. So this worked fairly well. Um, the average daily gain of those calves uh, was only 1.33. Could we have increased um, the performance of the calf by supplementing uh, a little bit more to the pears or creep feeding? It's a great question. Would it be cost effective? I have my theory, but I don't have any data to suggest it uh, or data to really support my theory. I do think we probably could get a little bit of benefit. The one time where creep feeding might pay is a situation where um, you have really low quality forage. And in particular, I, I wonder if the uh, distillers and the bypass protein we can get would be a benefit in this case. 
Uh, last couple things to talk about is how you supplement does matter. And this is data from sub irrigated meadow, but I think it's still useful to understand that basically if, if we compare bunk feeding to ground feeding, uh, we do see some impact on the performance that we get from cattle. And this was growing steers, but it really does show that they didn't get as much out of the supplement if we fed it on the ground. And if we back calculate the difference between here, it's equivalent to about 40% waste um, from the dried distiller. So uh, it may pay to drag a bunk out there if you're feeding dried distillers. Uh, if you're feeding wet distillers, the situation is a little bit different. Um, it's only about 16% waste. And uh, that response was um, just a little bit less uh, if we had feeding on the ground versus the bunk. So it, that's kind of interesting to me that this doesn't look nearly as bad. So probably if I'm using dry, I wanna run a bunk out there, maybe it's not worth the extra labor. It really depends on what your labor costs are and how much the distillers cost you, uh, whether you wanna do it with wet. Uh, one last comment would be that if uh, you're looking for corn residue, I'd encourage you to go to uh, the crop residue exchange and I'll put the uh, address in the chat, but we do get uh, every year farmers putting um, some of their fields on the crop residue exchange and basically you can quarry as a livestock producer you can quarry anywhere in a radius around where you're at. So if you want to see if there's any fields near you that might be of interest, so you can contact that farmer, um, I would suggest you uh, go ahead and do that. 